Turn, if you would, to Psalm 130. <clears throat> Psalm 130. The title of the message is Iniquity Marked or Iniquity Gone? That's a question. And it's a question meant to be personal to each and every one of us concerning this problem of iniquity that we'll be addressing uh, in the text and some other uh, text here. <clears throat> Let's look at verse 1. We'll read through verse 8. Out of the depths have I cried unto you, O Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive <clears throat> to the voice of my supplications. If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who shall stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than they that watch for the morning. I say more than they watch for the morning. Let Israel hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. And he shall redeem Israel from all their iniquities. We'll be looking at a couple of those verses as we go down through here. We're going to be turning to a lot of texts. Um, the more lengthy sections, I'll have you turn there and just the one or two liners I'll read as usual. <clears throat> Believers uh, often notice that the teaching of the religious world measures and judges things differently than what the Word of God instructs. As we read the scripture, I think we see that all the time. We'll, we'll, we'll have explicit instructions in, I am the Lord thy God, this is how I am, and this is what you're supposed to judge things by, the way. And then we see the religious world attempting to sometimes model that, and then we have been given grace to see through that and uh, avoid that. We know that the Lord God is absolutely perfect, in his character, we know both him and his ways are both perfect. We know that the way that he measures things and judges things is done in perfect truth. No lie, no error, no cheating. It's perfect, flawless. He's holy, he's righteous, he's just, he's good, he's faithful. All these character attributes is what causes him to exercise his ways and display his ways so that we can see him for who he is and see the consistency in the splendor of all his character. Uh, God Almighty is he's detailed in his instructions. He is precise when he talks about his ways, and uh, especially the way of salvation, he, he talks with precision. In other words, he makes a big deal about his accuracy and what he says about the truth. In all of his dealings, he's that way. We just see also in the Word of God, there are these terms used to express the way that God does things and sees things and judges things. And there are these terms that deal with uh, measuring instruments. Uh, just a few examples. We see there's scales as far as uh, in reference to balance. There's um, measuring instruments, whether it be a ruler or a square or a plummet, which I call a plumb bob. Um, some of you have used some of these things. I remember being a part of, um, in a different company, a, a quality department where 
people would bring their manufacturing measuring instruments to the quality center and they would be calibrated. They had to be checked because you can't be using bad instruments to measure because if you do, you're going to build things wrong. God's salvation, the foundation of his, sal of, of his salvation is secure. It's, it's firm. It has a foundation. It's built on Christ. And it's measured and scaled and balanced perfectly. And it reflects his character. And we know, uh, uh, the more we study, that the importance to not deviate from that. And when we see that in God, that is something that we glory in. And it causes us to worship. And then we see who we are and we see, well, that's a kind of a difference between him and us, you know. Um, if you can imagine sometimes when you see just people, human, sinful human beings that can do certain things or that are good at keeping it together and that are organized and you look at the things they do and you think, I wish I could do that. Well, just times that times a bajillion as far as God's concerned. And it's just, it's, it's otherworldly, no doubt about it. You just, it, you can't take it in. The difference that is between sinful man and a perfect God. And um, some of these things you see the, the further along you go and the older you get. And then the more you long to be with him face to face. In our younger days, we may have been immature and more proud and thought, thought we had it all together and maybe talked like we did. At least we thought we could fake people out. But, um, you know, to me, the older I get, just the more transparent um, I want to be, want to seem to be. And if you come into it with humility, you don't have to upkeep anything. It's not a competition anymore. You know, I'm a sinner. I I'm, I'll argue with Paul, as I said before, I'm the chief of sinners. So now I'm not in competition with anybody. Christ is my righteousness. I don't have to worry about outperforming anyone or looking better than anyone. Or It takes too much energy, spiritual energy. I ain't got time for it. And neither should you. And that's not the way we're to be anyway. Scripture teaches us to... Um, be humble and not be prideful. So we know, or at least with this knowledge comes an understanding that through the means of the word of God, we see these things. The spirit of God dwells in us, guides us, teaches us. And unfortunately, from our past failures, we see that we don't have it all together and that God does. And he's the standard of perfection. And in those times past, when we were wrong in our past experiences, especially, of course, in false religion, we didn't see him or his ways the way that he really was. You know, a text comes to mind where God's talking in Psalm somewhere to those that aren't seeing him like he should be seen. And he says, you know, you thought all I was altogether like unto yourself. And I think, uh, especially unbelievers, they... They form a God of their imagination, and they decide, they tweak, almost like a buffet, what attributes they want to be stronger. They need to still be in control, you know, so they don't look bad. And they form this God kind of like themselves, and they might tweak up some things that maybe depends from person to person. But anyway, all these things that we didn't see in the past, God now has graciously He's made a difference, we see, between his people and those that are not his people that we very well could have been a part of if he didn't choose us unto salvation. Today, with that thought in mind, I want us to see in the area concerning iniquity, how he made that difference between these two groups of chosen and not chosen. So, what is iniquity? Before we even get started and looking up some text, we want to look at what is it? What does that mean? I mean, that's a word that um, it's not thrown around on the street, you know, commonly. So <clears throat> the Old Testament, the Hebrew word is 
uh, Avon, and really if you look at it, it looks like Avon, so the conspiracy theorists can do whatever they want with looking into the Avon company, whether it's evil or not. But, uh, and there's a lot of them out there right now listening probably, but it means um, perversity, evil, fault, or sin. And it comes from a root word that means to make crooked or pervert. And in the Greek, when the word iniquity is used, it is anoma. And it means illegality, wickedness, transgression of the law, unrighteousness. And it comes from a root word that means lawless, not subject to the law, or without law. So that's what iniquity is. Nothing in there is positive. It's all against God. Because uh, one of the first points we're going to see here is that in God is no iniquity. So bringing back this idea about God being uh, precise in his measures and his judgments, the scales of justice, for example, they must balance in favor of the one being judged. And when I say in favor of, what's that mean? That means grace. God shows favor toward his people in Christ. So it is not the old humanistic idea that we hear conversations about and maybe even seen visually on cartoons or uh, comics or whatever about the false religious idea of as long as your good outweighs your bad, you're going to be okay. Well, of course, whenever we thought that way in the past, we didn't know what good or bad was. We didn't know that there's none good and that those that are unbelievers, everything that is done is sin. We were clueless of that. And when we were born of God and saw ourselves for who we were and studied the scripture and were guided by the spirit and were edified by one another in talking about doctrine and as we grew in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, we learned um, very quickly from the very start about what total depravity was, what it meant about our legal state and our inabilities. And we talk about that when we uh, actually preach the gospel. So this is not something that people learn about 10 or 20 years later. This is like what they uh, are born with, this knowledge. They see their sin. I've got, a th I think it's seven points if I remember right. And the first point is this. There is no iniquity in God. No iniquity in him. Let's turn to Deuteronomy 32. We're going to look at verses 1 through 4. I just basically have a bunch of text I'm going to be looking at. I'll make some comments in reference to these points. Uh, a lot of this talks about the character of God, no doubt. Give ear, O you heavens, and I will speak. And hear, O earth, the words of my mouth. This is God talking. Um, obviously, he has something important to say always. But here he kind of uses language to draw your attention to, I'm getting ready to say something. I want you to listen. And then the first thing he says is, my doctrine. Well, that's what he speaks. Whatever he speaks, he's, he's speaking in a teaching way. My doctrine shall drop as the rain. Well, evidently, God's doctrine is not dry. Huh? It's not dry. You've heard about that dead, dry, cold doctrine. This is, that's another God. I don't know what that's about, but this God 
is hydrating people with his doctrine. I think I'm going to do a message, a whole message on that pretty soon. My speech shall distill as the dew. There's another wet word, right? Oh, here's another. As the small rain upon the tender herb. Here's another wet word. And as the showers upon the grass. There's no dryness here at all. Because I will publish the name of the Lord, ascribe you greatness unto our God. He is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, without iniquity, just and right he is. These are unchanging eternal facts about who God is. This will never, this is how God has always been. This is how God will always be. And knowing that, <laughs> there's a problem with man automatically. You have to deal with this God in a way that is able to agree with his judgment and with his truth. You can't you can't get around it. You can't cheat. You are nobody special that you are able to somehow um, be respected above other sinners. It's not going to work. This, this is not your, your city or county or state uh, court that you might be able to have a buddy involved or, or slip some money. or You know what I'm saying? It's not going to work. Perfection includes all these things. Truth, no iniquity, justice, righteousness. This is him. This is who defines him. I'm going to read these next two texts because they're just short. Second Chronicles 19.7 says, Wherefore now let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. There is no iniquity with the Lord our God nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. I would imagine probably the King James says bribes. I would just about guess. But you get the idea. It's tied to what I was just talking about earlier, that you can't cheat with this God. Because if God was to compromise that part of his character and cheat, God knows before anybody else that that would be a lie and not the truth. It would be unjust. His justice has to be satisfied. Things are done right by him. And this is one that we've talked about in many times in, in, in times past. The first part of the verse, Habakkuk 1.13 says, You are of purer eyes than to behold evil and cannot look upon iniquity. And I usually add some commentary to that to explain that latter part. It means that God cannot look upon iniquity and let it slide in his court. He must punish sin, in other words. So he has no iniquity in him. Secondly, he hates iniquity. And he even hates the workers of it. Let's be reminded again that... Um, Iniquity and sin are broad in that it can be outward immorality. You know, it can be it can be stealing, killing, um, raping. Um, you know, these things that are outwardly seen. It can be, of course, the inward thoughts. Christ taught a lot of that in the New Testament. That if you Look upon a woman with lust. You've committed adultery. Even though you didn't physically, it's in the heart. If you hate someone, um, then it is equivalent to murder. So it is the act of the heart without the physical act. So there's the inward sins. And out of um, uh, the Word of God, it warns us over and over and over again that the very worst kind of sin 
and I've, I've proven this several times before and will continue to, is the subtle, the most offensive sin to God is the subtle and deceiving sin of self-righteousness, the deceivableness of unrighteousness. And this is religious sins, trying to be accepted separately from Christ or other than in Christ alone. That is a spit in the face to the glory of God, and you are in competition with the person and work of Christ if you are committing self-righteousness or trying to establish a righteousness of our own. So there's those two type sins, and both can be done inwardly, outward immorality or self-righteousness. Sometimes they're seen outwardly, but they start in the heart before they even come out in the first place. So I wanted to remind us of, because uh, when we start talking about iniquity, as we read all these texts, sometimes people automatically superimpose that everything is only, you know, outward immorality. And it's just talking about these people that we see on the news every night. It's not us, right? When we, when we say that, we're committing that sin that I warned us about, thinking that we're better than someone else. Comparing ourselves with ourselves. I'm going to read um, three short verses here. Exodus 34, 7 says, Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. I'll read a similar one, almost the same thing in Numbers 14, 18. The Lord is long-suffering and great of great mercy, forgiving iniquity and transgressions, and by no means clearing the guilty. Now notice, it said that by no means he will clear the guilty. So if he's going to clear somebody... Guilt has to be removed. When guilt's removed, he can clear somebody. But until then, he can't clear them. This goes back to his ways are just and, and righteous, and he doesn't lie. All of his judgments are in truth. Here's a very popular one we're very familiar with, Psalm 5.5. 5, the foolish shall not stand in your sight. You hate all workers of iniquity. That's people, not just the iniquity, but workers of iniquity. We've, we hear from false religion all the time, God hates the sin, but loves the sinner. And then he ends up sinning them to hell, which we struggle to try to figure that one out. We probably used to even say it, and we didn't, you know, we were dead, zombies, religious zombies. Turn to uh, Psalm 14. There's uh, four verses there I want us to look at. Uh, part of this is repeated in Romans 3. Paul quotes part of this text here. Now remember, we're still under the section of that God hates iniquity and the workers of iniquity. Psalm 14, 1. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. Now, notice uh, if you have a Bible that makes a distinction with italics, the word there is is in italics, which means it's supplied by the translators. And, um, you know, sometimes when I see italics, I think, well, that makes sense. Probably helps us understand some things. But if you take that out, the fool has said in his heart, no, God as a rebellious answer to whatever God says. Now, either way, it's bad. And I'm not a language expert to tell you which one to think about, but I think we can think about both because they're both true. I'm not saying that um, all texts have multiple meanings, but either one is, is condemning. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. Now, again, when we, when we see these terms like abominable works, uh, 
let's not only think about, you know, Charles Manson and Hitler and Jeffrey Dahmer and, you know, Joseph Stalin and all these people. When we start thinking about people that have killed a lot of people or not just pedophiles or rapists, again, self-righteousness is the most and the greatest abomination that there is. Remember the words of Christ in Matthew 11, where he was talking to the religious people that were not believing the gospel, and he said it's going to be more tolerable in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than it will be for you religious people that are not believing grace. It's an abomination. There is none that does good. Now, there is the quote that Paul used in Romans 3, verse 2. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men. I think we talked about this in our um, Chosen in Christ series when we talked about the Armenian version of foreknowledge. God looking down the, through the future to see what he would see and make a choice based on what he would see. Well, here, this blows that away. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any that did understand and did seek God. They're all gone astray. They're all together become filthy. There is none that does good, no, not one. So much for that false view of God's looking down through the future to see who would choose him. It says here that nobody would. Nobody ever has. Verse 4. Have all the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Well, that's an easy one. Who eat up my people as they eat bread and call not upon the Lord? We're told in other places that those people hate knowledge. They not only don't have it, they hate it. In, uh, go to Hebrews chapter 1 while I read this verse. Um, Matthew 7, uh, we, we've worn this one out before, which we've, we tied in with Psalm 5.5 5, where it says that God hates all workers of iniquity. Matthew 7, 23, then I will profess unto them. This is the guy that said, Lord, Lord, haven't I done this, that, and the other, some, all these good works. I will profess unto them, I never knew you, which we know that word knew has to do with affection or relationship or love. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work, there's the word, iniquity. So this verse lends to the point I was talking about, uh, self-righteousness. Because this guy was a religious guy. He was a go-getter. He was uh, doing everything he could. He was on fire, so to speak. Outwardly, if you would look at him, you'd think, this dude is getting some stuff done. He's outperforming everybody else. Well, Christ sets lawlessness, iniquity. It's the worst thing he could have done. He thought it was the best, which means he was deceived. Hebrews 1, now, in verse 8 Look there, verse 8 and 9. But unto the Son, he said, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. Now, think back what we talked about, how God is, who he is and how he is, how he does things, his ways. How that he is, all his character attributes are compounded one with another. When you contrast his character attributes and you blend them, it's crazy in your mind. It just You look at God and it's just like, he's not just eternal. I mean, it, that's hard to take in in and of itself. But he's eternally omniscient. He's not just omnipotent. He's sovereignly and holy and eternally. You just start crossing all these attributes. <laughs> you, know what that, you know what that means? I'm God and there's none else. <laughs> but he rules and he sits on his throne and he's a, he, he has the scepter of righteousness. And what he's, what he's saying is, what I do, I do in a righteous way. 
Otherwise, I wouldn't have this thing here that shows my power and how that I do things. So when the, the judge, who Christ will be the judge in the end, when you approach his throne, he's going to have this scepter of righteousness. It represents something, whether or not it's a physical thing or not. Maybe it is, but when people look at it, it's going to be like, uh-oh. <laughs> I didn't know this was going to be the guy <laughs> that has this narrow and strict and precise way of judging. I thought he was altogether like unto myself. Verse 9, attributing to Christ You've loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness above your fellows. I'm talking about the preeminence of Christ, the exaltation of Christ, and just the wisdom in Christ, and this, this only way that God has wisely chose in the way he was going to save his people for his own glory. There he sits at the right hand of the throne, high and lifted up. Thirdly, because of who God is, he must punish sin because of his holy character. We kind of alluded to this already. Back in our text, the one line there, which is part of the title of the message, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities. O oh Lord, who shall stand? You know, I was, this is kind of like an out of the ordinary thought about this text, but something that came to mind when I was thinking about this was that when the psalmist wrote this, there's a part about it that, that says either somebody is eternally saved or they're not. It's almost, it's a negative statement sort of, but it's almost a defense for eternal security. Because you either have to have iniquities taken away or you're not going to make it. So if they are taken away, you are going to make it. You're safe. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. You know what that means? With the shedding of blood, there is the remission of sins. They're taken away. The word mark here, if you, Lord, should mark iniquities. The word mark in the Hebrew it has a shamar. Is my, there's my Hebrew scholastics, shamar. It's a primitive root, uh, and it means properly to hedge about, for example, as with thorns, that is to guard, uh, generally to protect or attend to, to take heed to, to keep, to look narrowly, to observe, to preserve, to regard, to reserve, so those are things, I mean, you look at some of those words and you think, well, some of those sound positive. But if you think about the way God is looking at iniquities and marking them, let's think about God's eyes in reference to judgment, right? So he's guarding these iniquities like, I'm, I'm keeping track of them. They're not going anywhere. You're, they're piling up, right? Right. You're heaping up judgment. I'm aware of them. I'm, I'm taking heed to them. I see them. Um, you're not going to get by me. You're not going to fool me. I'm observing them. And I'm preserving them as far as they all will be punished. So when you look at it that way and know how God is, it's quite scary. This is a God 
that is a consuming fire. So every person that ever has or ever will be born will either bear their own iniquity. I noticed in the Old Testament that word was used over and over and over again. Talking about bearing his iniquities, that means to hold or to carry their own iniquity on their own account. Or Christ has taken on that iniquity when it was imputed or charged to his account. It's one or the other. It's either you have it on your own account, you're carrying it, or Christ has taken care of it through his account. I mean, that's a fact. That's an unchangeable fact. And you can bring it, when you're dealing with people, you need to bring it down to that simple. Because everybody wants to talk about a bunch of religious stuff. That happened to me again this week. I was talking about, I mean, getting down to some serious, clear gospel talk. And this person wanted to bring up something about what's going on over at Israel right now. And, uh, you know, I, I kind of caught myself starting to chuckle, but I remembered, I thought, shouldn't surprise me. That's one of those things, you know, that's just... That means you didn't hear a word I said, and there goes the diversion. So this, we know that this is uh, this thing of salvation. It's it's a legal matter. It's a legal matter in the court of God. It's according to His law and justice, and we know, and we see over and over again that God demands absolute. Perfection and nothing less. Nothing less. He's too precise. He cannot behold iniquity and let it slide. Turn to Psalm 25. Psalm 25. And let's read verse 7. Seven through eleven. Remember not the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, you, uh, me for, uh, remember you me for your goodness, your goodness' sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, will he teach sinners in the way. That's like in the way of righteousness, in the way of the Lord, the way that he thinks. Remember, by nature, his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. So those that he loves, he will teach his ways and teach his thoughts. Besides that, he gives us the mind of Christ. Verse 9, the meek will he guide in judgment, and the meek will he teach his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth unto such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. And this is pretty good here. For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. Kind of remind me of verse 3 of the song we sang earlier. My sin, oh, the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin, not in part, but the whole. My iniquity is great. Not great in his, it's okay. It's a lot. And if you can say that with knowledge of knowing who that it's against and what iniquity requires to remove. It's a big deal. So it must be done. And, and this is a... You know, I've capitalized on this in the past, and um, in reference to that, this whole thing of salvation is is Godward. It's for His glory. God must do something for Himself before He does something for me. God did not create the world because He was lonely. He wanted to have a bunch of sinners that He could hang out with. Now, 
He created the world so that he could glorify himself in the death of Christ. And in the, in the meantime, those means involved was bringing sin into the world, getting rid of most of those people, and keeping the ones that would be the trophies of his grace, not because of them, not even necessarily for them, but for his name's sake. Most people they don't even think of that. That point is probably lower on the list than when people pray. They don't even thank God and worship God and praise God for who he is, but they're asking for stuff. Not that I haven't done that. But this, this we're missing out when we don't look to all this as for his name's sake, for his glory's sake. Pardoning my iniquity is a nice benefit, but again, it's to his glory. And if he didn't do it the way he did it, because I know, I know how we would do it, how we've tried to do it by trying to do something ourselves, and we're not qualified to do it. So when we see that, we see his wisdom, we see his name, there's salvation in his name, we see his glory, and we see that he's put out ahead of us. Well, he's a jealous God. We've talked about that before. Not many people that I hear, they don't talk much about that. That's a big deal. God's a jealous God. Some people would say, well, he's an egomaniac. I was, I was talking to some um, guy that pretends to be a sovereign grace preacher, and he was griping about the absolute sovereignty of God and reprobation. And he was wanting to take that away and soften that. You know what comes to mind? God's a jealous God. Don't mess with that. That's mine. God gets ultimate credit and glory for the condemnation of the reprobate. Now, if, you don't, if you're not happy with that, you need to warm up to it because it's to the glory of God. It's for his name's sake. It's part of who he is. So God's people, they end up hearing what the law says. Unbelievers don't. They can't hear the law. They don't know what the law requires because the law is connected to God. And they don't know what God requires. Look at Matthew 23. This section, uh, starting in verse 26, there's a section here where you know, it's probably the hardest blast against false religion, chapter 23 of Matthew, that is in the scripture. Christ blasts the, the Pharisees for their self-righteousness. And we can see our past in here. And this talks about iniquity. You, uh, verse 26, you blind Pharisee, cleanse first that which is within the cup and platter, that the outside of them may be clean also. Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like unto whited sepulchers, which indeed appear beautiful outwardly, but are within full of dead men's bones and un and of all uncleanness, uncleanliness. It, it's full of rot. That's where dead people are laid to rest. Fancy on the outside, but rotten on the inside. Verse 28, even so, you also outwardly appear righteous unto men. I mean, that's their whole gig. I mean, that's, that's the purpose of their religion, to appear righteous before men, so that they can get glory from men and get their reward. But within you are full of hypocrisy and what? Iniquity. Lawlessness. These were the lawyers. These were the supposed experts of the law and the, the scribes of the scripture. Not a very good um, label that Christ put on them. But they were religious, going about to do some religious. Everybody looked at them like they were the top dogs. Like, if anybody's getting to heaven, it's those guys. 
And then Christ said, well, your righteousness has to exceed theirs to get into heaven. And then some people, well, we got to work harder. we got to work harder with a, a different way, maybe a different angle. Hey, I know. How about we're saved by the Spirit and then we are made perfect in the flesh? We're able now. We're, we've been equipped to keep the law. Scribes and Pharisees didn't know how to keep it, but we do. So now we can make it by finishing up the job that... You see the problem there? Fifthly, the only way to have iniquity forgiven is to have our iniquities marked on a substitute. Right? If, if, if you're going to mark iniquities, Lord, who shall stand? And it's obvious, nobody. If you're going to mark them, nobody's going to stand. So in order to get by in a just way, is to have a substitute be marked in our place. The one that can do the right thing. The one who is the lawgiver, the law keeper, the law satisfier, who is the lawyer and the judge. <laughs> the rigged system of grace <laughs> through Christ. And it's not really rigged. It's just the right way. It's the only way. Look at our, uh, I can read our text again, part of it. It says, but there is forgiveness with you. You know, that's the only way of forgiveness, first of all. Counterwise, if you're going to mark iniquities, nobody's going to stand. But if a person can be forgiven, the only way they can is with you. That you may be feared. And you can look at it both ways. You can quake. If you're outside of Christ, you probably better quake in fear and trembling and dread of being punished for that sin of those iniquities. But if you are knowing the gospel, you're going to fear, like I think we are here this morning, in a reverential way, in an awe, looking to God and His, His ways and seeing the way He flawlessly redeemed His people through His Son so that he can be both a just God and a Savior, not a cheater. Not cheap grace, not cheap law. Neither one. Verse 5 in our text says, I wait for the Lord, my soul does wait, and in his word do I hope. That's where my confident expectation is, is what he says about the situation. And if I ever sin or get myself in a position where I have sinned, after I'm a believer, instead of making that step to go back to that old way, I wait. And usually pretty quickly, it's, I have a substitute, an advocate, a representative, a mediator. I have a savior. All these offices of the personal work of Christ uh, flood my mind and I have a thankfulness and a joy and a gratitude in reference to who I have now that has forgiven my sin. Go to Psalm 85. Let's go to Psalm 85. This is a in verse 1. This We haven't been here in a while. But this is the how. This is part of the how of how he... Uh, there's only one way to forgive iniquity, and this is the how. Psalm 85, 1. O Lord, you have been gracious to your land. You have brought back the captivity of Jacob. You have forgiven the iniquity of your people. You have covered all their sins. Selah. Selah, remember, is a phrase that means meditate upon it, think about it. Uh, in other words, it's a thought worth kind of hanging on to. Just don't miss it. Don't fly by it. It's important. Verse 3, you have taken away all your wrath. You have turned 
from the heat of your anger. Sounds like there was some propitiation going on here. That's what that does. That's what that is. It stops his wrath. Verse 4, turn us, O God of our salvation, and cause your anger toward us to cease. Will you be angry with us forever? Will you draw out your anger to all generations? You know, several times he's talked about to the second, to third, and the fourth generation. Show us mercy. They need a mercy seat, right? O Lord, grant us your salvation. Not just salvation. Do you see what's packed in that statement right there? It's not just we want your goodies. We want to be saved your way. First of all, we know that the only way to be saved is your way. We not only enjoy salvation, we enjoy it his way. And really, I really think the bulk of, of what we should think about in worship and the ministry is glorying about God's way. Not just that we're saved, but that who he is and how that he does it because of who he is. That'll keep you busy thinking about that, learning about it. Verse 8. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, and he will speak peace to his people. It's referring to reconciliation because of the propitiation. And to his saints, and let them not turn again to folly. Folly is those old ways of thinking, of trying to establish a righteousness of our own. That's the most foolish thing, and you don't even know it. He could have just as well said deception. Look at verse 9. Surely his, his salvation, there again it is, his salvation is near to those that fear him so that glory may dwell in our land. Here it is. This is God doing it the right way and the only way and the glorious way. Mercy and truth have met together. In order for God to be merciful to his people, again, he has to do it in, in a way of truth, without a lie. I'm not just talking about the gospel message and those that believe the gospel don't believe a lie. That's true. But what I'm saying is what it took to save us in the first place, overall, the, the way God shows mercy <clears throat> has to be done in truth, period. Even if nobody else was around but him, he must be true to himself. And when that's done, then there's the floodgates of grace. Then he can give us all spiritual blessings in Christ. When it is satisfied, when it is finished, when it's done to where he can be both a just God and Savior, we know it's done right. And we know all the stuff that he says he's going to do after that and give us, we're going to get because he did it the right way. The way that he said he would, the only way that it could be done, and the way that when we see it, we can have confidence that this is not fake. God didn't pretend. He really killed Christ in a just way because of my sin. Notice the rest here. Righteousness and peace have kissed each other. It's related to the first part of what we said here. The work that Christ did, and only he could do it because he was the only qualified one, he did it in a just and righteous way. So much so that when he was done with it, he said, it's finished, and it brought in peace. It brought in peace. We're familiar with Isaiah 53, 6. It says, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned each one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him 
that's referring to transferred on him, charged it to him, imputed the iniquity of us all, referring to his people. Go to Daniel 9.24. Getting close to the end here. This is the last verse in point five. We've got seven points. Daniel 9.24. Those uh, prophecy freaks that don't know anything about the gospel will come here and I don't know what they talk about. I don't even care. But here's the gospel in this right here. Daniel 9.24. Seventy weeks are determined upon your people and upon your city to finish the transgression, <laughs> to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity. And what? After that's done, what does that do? To bring in an everlasting righteousness. To seal up the vision of prophecy and anoint the most holy. Now people can write stupid books and make movies over that and it has something to do with what it doesn't have to do with. Go ahead. Gospel's in there. This, is, this had to happen here. And the way that this is to make an end to sins, to make reconciliate, to finish the transgression, to uh, make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in an everlasting righteousness and seal up the vision and crown him for who he is. <laughs> Sixthly. Sixthly. That sounds... <laughs> I couldn't put a TH in there. Uh, number six, those whose iniquities are covered <clears throat> are not imputed to them. And I want us to think about assurance as we um, think about this. Go to Jeremiah 31, and I will read Isaiah 40. <clears throat> Isaiah 40, in verse 1 and 2, comfort O oh, comfort my people, says the Lord. Now, God told Isaiah to do this for his people. Now, that's my job, too. Um, I'm not officially considered a prophet, not even an apostle in an apostolic authority way. I have the prophet's and apostles' words, so I speak with their authority. And what God tells me to do is comfort his people. I'm not going to assume uh, something on people that they're converted by me bringing in some watered-down gospel and say, I just feel sorry for you people. Here, take this watered-down gospel and I'll just speak words of comfort to you. And in the end, you're going to be condemned because I'm a false prophet. And that's what's going on worldwide right now. You know how particular I am. God has made me particular to see his precision. So that comes to me and I, and I see that this is serious. So when I deal this out to you, I make sure that you look at it as serious. When you've acknowledged that it's serious and it's true and this is the only way, I'm going to give you comfort. Speak lovingly to the heart of Jerusalem, which represents the church there, and cry to her that what? Her warfare is done. What do I got to do? What do I got to do to, I want to do something to be righteous. Her warfare is done. I remember um, Mahan years ago. You know, there was a pulpit mic, you know, up here. And whenever he would get a serious point, He'd get up close on it and talk like that. <laughs> and um, <clears throat> some point about this, I don't know, he's talking about something being done. And he said, tis done. He got up on the mic. <laughs> and um, I, I remember in times past, and that was years ago. I remember in times past when uh, my dad would hear things about salvation and hear people talking about doing things. And he would always repeat that, tis done. 
I could do it this mic here. Tis done like that. So I don't know what it's going to sound like. That's the idea. Uh, I want to emphasize that. The churches, the Jerusalem, which represents a church, her warfare is done. That, that, he said it's finished, right? That her iniquity is pardoned. That's part of it. You know, you're in prison. I, I always hear this all the time on the radio about these high government officials, whether they be governors or presidents or whatever, they, they have this ability to pardon people. Well, I mean, they don't do it like God does it. God has to have a backing, a just backing, a, a, a substitute, the whole thing. But they can just wield their authority and say, eh, come on out of jail free, you know. Uh, but can you imagine, though, those people coming out of jail? And some of them were, maybe even most of them, were actually guilty of crimes. But can you imagine, it's like, no legal b boundness at all. They're, they're free. Nobody can stop them. For she has received the Lord's hand double for her sins. It's taken care of. Hyperabundant amount of grace. There is no fear of losing salvation. Who can lay anything to the charge of God's elect? She's received double what the Lord's hands for her sins. There's can't can't touch God's sheep. Uh, I think you're in Jeremiah 31. Look at verse 31. This is part of the promise of the covenant. Uh, and again, when you hear God talking in, in language of covenant, he's talking about oath, he's talking about swearing, he's talking about promises. It's all the language that's kind of like a little higher up and like it's sure and certain. 31, uh, 31, 31 here, Jeremiah 31, 31. Behold, the days come, says the Lord, that I will um, make a new covenant. Modern King James says here, cut a covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, which covenant of mine they broke, by the way, he says, Although I was a husband unto them, says the Lord, but this shall be a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall no more teach uh, man his neighbor, and each man of them to the greatest of them. Uh, um, I got lost there. Each man, his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the uh, least to the greatest, says the Lord, for or because I will forgive their iniquity. And what else? I will remember their sins no more. This is a covenant, this is a promise. This is um, a sure and certain thing. We're going to go to go to one more. Go to one more text here. Romans Romans four. In verse 1, what shall we say then that our father Abraham has found according to the flesh? For because if Abraham was justified works by works, he has a reason to boast, but not before God. God, God doesn't do that. He, he won't let Abraham do that. In other words, what's the scripture say? In other words, what does God's mouth say from his heart, from his mind? It says that Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness. It was uh, righteousness was reckoned to him through faith, God-given faith. Verse 4, But to him working, the reward is not reckoned according to grace, but according to debt. So we know what this means, that if a person was working for salvation, it wouldn't be by grace that God would owe them salvation. 
And if God owed them salvation, then they would be able to boast because they earned it. But that's not the way it is. Look at verse 5. But to him not working. It could have just as well said, but to him unconditionally. But believing on him, justifying the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Now, I don't have time to develop this thought, but here in verse 5, I just want to say this real quick, that faith is not the righteousness. The object of faith is counted as our righteousness, the Lord our righteousness. We don't have faith in our faith. Even as David, verse 6, describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness without works or without conditions, saying, blessed are those whose iniquities, that's lawlessness, remember, are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will in no wise impute sin or iniquity, either one. That's one of my favorite sections of scripture there. There's a lot there. Um, last point. If we don't hit this point, people are going to call me antinomian. I'm already a minute or an hour and five minutes. Depart from iniquity is the concluding um, exhortation. Turn to Titus chapter 2. As if the good news and all the stuff that we're given in Christ wasn't enough to cause you to be motivated to serve God, here are some things that are clear that's instruction. What I was getting at was if I didn't do this last point, people would say, well, you're not encouraging people to serve God. Well, if you didn't get out of those first six points, you're, you're not alive. You're not spiritually alive. If grace doesn't motivate you to serve, Titus 2, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, that we should live soberly and righteously and godly in this present world, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. It goes back to the the gospel stuff too. It says, who gave himself for us, substitution, that he might redeem us by his blood, right? Purchased us from what? All iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. God's people are are eager to serve him. They're, they're willing to serve him. They want to serve him. And they do serve him in different capacities. But before we do anything, the gospel knowledge of the fact that we are already accepted in Christ must be in place and able to operate by the proper motive in serving God by faith and love and in gratitude cheerfully. If you don't have that straight, that we're not serving to stay out of hell or get to heaven, that we're already completely, 100% accepted in Christ. We can't be any more accepted after we believe the gospel. It seems like some people say that you can progressively get more acceptable. It's scary, isn't it? But false religion what they'll do is just that. They'll use fear, and manipulation, and we know that causes you to look inside for a personal righteousness, personal holiness that's your own, it's your own righteousness. Can't be doing it. So I hope there were some things there that, that caused us to think maybe deeper into uh, who God is and, and His way and 
an appreciation and gratitude in reference to removing our iniquities, not marking them, because we know if they were marked, we, we're done, we're goners. And we know that we can't remove them ourselves. Nobody can. And the sad thing is we know people that are, they're religious, they're getting crazy with their religion, but we know that in the end, if, if God doesn't give them repentance from their false religion and grant them faith in Christ alone, they're going to face God at judgment, who's not going to be cheating at judgment. He's going to call them out on their iniquity. Any questions or comments? I always, I, it's always like around 105 to 113, 109. I'm trying to keep it under 59. I can't control it. It's all predestinated. It's going to be my excuse. Nothing? Huh? <laughs> It's the purpose that is within himself.